Okay, in this presentation, I'm going to go over your judicial opinion responses. Um, and the, the goal of this assignment and the goal of this presentation is to help you see how the Constitution is an attempt to describe the rules of the game or one set of rules uh, of the game of social relations. Uh, and I want you to be able to see the difference between those experiencing injustice those working for the state uh, to maintain control or what folks call order, um, and then those who are judges who are stuck kind of in the middle uh, and who are trying to give an explanation of how uh, something like a rule of law could apply uh, given so many different perspectives. So one student uh, articulated something that I've called a P-prim, uh, or a naive um, or an uninformed position, right? And this represents m most of your judicial opinions. Uh, and this is typical from semester to semester uh, and of folks who don't study law. Uh, so this is where I'm trying to move you a little bit, right? I'm not, ex I'm not expecting you nor grading you uh, to behave like a lawyer, um, but some difference from where you started is what I'm looking for. Um, so the general kind of um, admission or confession here uh, is that, you know, when this person thinks about law, it sounds like something that I can't do without permission, or if I do it without permission, then I have to get punishment for that. Now, this is, you know, it almost sounds common sense um, because the closest kind of um, experience you have with rules is usually in your family or if you're dating someone. Uh, in that sense, there will be punishment or consequences when you do things they don't like. And so you interpret those to be rules, in other words, focused on how you maintain your relationship with those people. Uh, but to abstract that or to universalize that, to expect that's the way it works with everyone in the world um, is incorrect. And so, you know, when this person says we as humans face rules, that makes it sound like rules are a thing or a object that they come out and they stop you from doing something. Um, again, you might feel this way. And that's what, you know, the person says it sounds like or when I think about it, uh, it might feel like this is the way it is. But this is, of course, not real. You can't go to the store and buy a rule uh, or a law to follow you around and tell you what to do. Uh, so we want to think of rules or laws as much more liquid or uh, hard to define um, and not as an object. It's not a hammer. Um, it's not uh, it's not a ball. Right. It's not something that I can touch. Uh, it is like that. Right. And that's what we want to start to talk like. It is like an object uh, or it is like a tool, but it is not a tool. So. Final thoughts to consider as you kind of move forward. I'm going to repeat these, but one, law is not an object, right? So most folks do not activate their rights. In other words, uh, most folks believe that law will protect them. Uh, and many of you uh, seem to think that an ideal law would have protected both Kaime uh, and Tony uh, in the fact pattern. But law will not protect you from fire, right? And that's kind of the main uh, takeaway that you should be thinking about. Um, the failure to follow the law was not a cause of the fire. The fire was the cause of death, right? So um, I know you're trying to attach those two things, but but that isn't quite the problem here. Um, and the reason I'll get to in a little bit is because there are exceptions to the rule. And most of you picked a rule that has pretty obvious exceptions that um, you did not apply. Uh, so the idea here is that law is not an object and it is not an absolute universal. In other words, um, law is not like gravity, right? Gravity is an absolute universal on Earth, uh, but law is not. Um, and so you, you can't think about law as something that will always work all the time and that will stop everything. Uh, instead, you need to think about the idea that the origins of legal cases arise from social conflicts that are not clearly settled. So there is no universal standard here. This is why we have to have the case in the first place. So legal rules are really flexible um, and they're kind of like norms. They're, they're not exactly like norms. Um, norms would be something like um, 
everyone in your family celebrates a certain holiday at a certain time every year, right? That would be the norm uh, or the typical way of acting. Um, but you could probably think of an exception. Such and such uncle doesn't show up, you know, each year. So that's the exception to the norm. Um, and then they're not equally applied automatically, right? So it depends on the judge, right? It depends on what neighborhood you're in. It depends on your subjective kind of reality, uh, how it's going to be applied. So you have to think about them as much more flexible. They're not fixed things that are going to solve every problem. And then the reason for this is that law is a language tool for a group to use against another group. In other words, um, it's not a hammer, but it is used like a hammer. Uh, but it's just language, right? Um, and language is obviously very powerful. Um, so when I say just language, I'm not meaning to demean it at all. But again, it is not an automatic uh, tool that jumps up and, and solves the you know solves the problem. Uh, so remember that this language law is a socially constructed tool. Uh, so again, it's not a physical tool. It's a social tool. So this is a lot to look at, but I, I just want to kind of help you have this picture in your mind. So another mistake you, you often make is about power. So power is uh, not the ability to get somebody to do uh, what they don't want to do, right? That's violence or force. Um, but power are these little lines that connect everybody together, right? It's the circuitry that allows us to think that we can use violence. Uh, to think that we can use legislation, to think that we can use protest, right? Or in some situations, we ignore uh, an action, and that's that kind of largest group, right? The apathetic group. Um, so if we kind of think about the injustices of Tony and Kaime, um, and again, most of you did not focus on the injustice of Maxine, and especially Maxine's son, who was handcuffed, handcuffed to a table. Uh, I'm sorry, was handcuffed at one point. Um, you know, I think what we're really trying to see here is how do you start to think about rights uh, and law as a tool within the social environment that we exist uh, within? So if you look over at the right hand side, the easiest way to do this is to start. Well, there are five elements uh, that we can think of when we think of legal knowledge. Um, so most of us uh, and most of you in particular are getting your knowledge about law from pop popular culture, whether it's TV, movies, um, word of mouth, your experience within your families, um, you know, that that is not the same as the way a judge experiences law. And so the knowledge is different. Um, so judicial de decisions are much different than popular culture ideas. And most of you are able to kind of see this as you work through the assignment. But, it, you know, most of you also then, not most of you, a large number of you picked a legislative text um, called the Civil Code. Uh, that's another form of legal knowledge, but again, it's different than pop culture and it's different than judicial decisions. Then there's enforcement policies, right? Those that the police uh, act out every day. Those are different forms of legal knowledge. And then finally, there's economic routines like contracts um, and other ways that we kind of experience our day to day uh, as we go about buying and selling things. So all of these interact and influence each other. They're not separate. Uh, but we obviously are separating them here um, to try to have a better understanding of them. So clearly you're going to utilize or draw upon uh, your pop culture ideas. And I see this, you know, mostly through your assignments. I'm trying to now move you towards combining judicial decisions and popular culture ideas. And most of you did a good job of that. You're now seeing there's a tension there. There's a difficulty. It's not clear. They don't overlap with each other. Uh, a few of you were able to get into the legislative texts. Um, a handful of you also were able to look at the environment, the enforcement policies. However, none of you talked about the economic routines. Now, you know, this could be surprising or not surprising, depending on how you feel about uh, what's called the veil of ignorance, hegemony, um, or the fact that our existence uh, is largely shaped by economic choices uh, long before we were born. Um, and this is really what Black Lives Matter and the protest movements are about, is that we still live in an economic society based in slavery, based in racial superior uh, superiority. And so until that economic situation is changed, our choices are very limited. In other words, even in the hypothetical, everything is limited based on these little lines that you see, these circuits. Um, and so legislation is a tool, 
uh, but largely for pro property rights people because that's who works in Congress, people who believe in property rights. Uh, property rights are listed in the Constitution. Uh, and so the control group, the, the group that has control over everybody else, the property owners, are able to use violence as a tool through the police, through NYPD. And this is then what leads to protesting. This is the humanity rights resisting the right of violence to be only given to pro property folks. So I know that's a complicated thing and you're going to have to think about that for a while. Uh, so I'll just move on to this next statement that'll help you think about it more clearly, uh, which is that, you know, there are two systems that shape our choices within the law. And the first one is the property first mindset, uh, which is the mass public that believe in pro property rights over human rights. Uh, and then there's the racist uh, first mindset, right? In other words, that uh, those folks who hold the property in America, it's white males, uh, have the right to hold property because they're white males. Uh, and again, this is evident in the Constitution, and, and there's so much that you could do research-wise on this, um, that even if you read stuff on, on the alt-right uh, kind of websites, um, they're not really denying this. Uh, this is such a, a scientific fact that there's no point denying it. Uh, the point is not you know, so much that this system exists, right? That's hard for some people to accept. Um, but the idea is that it shapes our choices. So even if you're resisting, you're still resisting to that system, right? So the racist property system is what creates this social conflict in the first place. So it's not it's not even, you know, fire in the hypo causes the death. But what causes the fire? Well, the protest. But what causes the protest? Well, the NYPD violence. Well, what causes the NYPD violence? Well, law, right? Judges and legislation and pro and common, you know, popular culture ideas about it. So you kind of see how this whole system is constituted uh, by this law. And that's what we mean, right? So law is just one tool of many different tools uh, within these social relations that are constituted in law. Uh, in other words, law is the kind of thing that gets the whole process started. And by thing, we mean rules of the game. And so the game is the property first and the racist first game. Uh, and law is just one way to keep that, ga uh, that game going. Of course, by having rules of a game, if you've ever played basketball or you've ever played uh, chess or you've ever played a video game, that also creates resistance to those rules, right? People can use the rules against the rule maker. And that's what we're really seeing here is there's the status quo, the folks who have property and they believe in property uh, as being first, they're in control. And then you have this other group uh, who believes, no, 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 human rights or humans are more important or black lives matter, not black property matters, right? Black lives matter. Uh, this is the resistance of human rights to that set of rules. And so if you want to look at change in the social relations, including in this hypo, you have to go way back to the property, uh, to the, the property versus human rights argument, right? Why can't folks protest the, the fact that human rights are being violated? Well, because they might destroy property. This is what most of you have said throughout the semester, and you're simply echoing what people say on the news uh, and in political debate. So again, the ideas about law are coming from pop culture first. Uh, judges, however, again, operate in a different kind of standard. So let me now work on this from the way that you answered the questions. So the most commonly cited legal rule was the Miranda case. Uh, and this is one student described it this way. Once someone is detained by the police, invokes Miranda by expressing a desire to remain silent, have counsel present or both, the police must stop the interrogation. Most of you seem to be very you know, familiar with this. I think it's fascinating, right? 13 of you um, focused on this part, the denial of representation. And was I kind of getting you to think that way? Well, sure, right? In the same way that Sherlock Holmes uh, often deals with the red herring. This was a, a bit of a trick to see if this is the thing that pop culture or that you'd focus on first. Um, so again, 13 of you did. I don't know if this is because you learned this in criminal justice, you know, in, in previous. That would be fascinating if you did. Uh, or if this is, again, something that is readily visible in TV and movies. Um, again, I'm not sure you'd have to tell me. The second most common, and this is for those of you who were just looking at the denial of representation, will think about this. Uh, four people uh, 
again, right, that don't know each other. We weren't in class. They were working on their own. Uh, they actually focused on discrimination and they looked at a civil code uh, under the Civil Rights Act. And so, you know, this is interesting. This was more about workplace uh, and racial discrimination. Four people did this. Uh, so again, this is this is a different way of seeing the problem and a different way of seeing the injustice, which goes back to prove, right, that there are multiple ways of looking at law. Three of you uh, weren't quite talking about denial of representation. You were talking about inappropriate law enforcement policies and procedures. Um, one of you actually, I, I would agree with you, right? If I if I were a lawyer in this situation, um, I would bring a false arrest, uh, which is called false imprisonment in tort law, uh, based on the police being negligent um, in this case. Um, however, again, I, I'd be coming from a legal point of view, right? From somebody who's been trained in the law, uh, not in pop culture. So those of you who are looking at the detective being wrong, um, and acting improperly, that goes back to this like psychological motivation that, you know, the detective isn't acting uh, within the, the realm of law, that he is somehow acting outside of the realm of law. Um, again, this happens on TV and movies all the time, uh, but this does not happen in real life, right? Uh, the detective is trained, he's been given uh, procedures. So you don't like the way he speaks, but speaking uh, is not a crime, uh, and speaking uh, discriminately is also not a crime. Um, again, on TV and movies, I'm sure it is, but in real life, it is not. Uh, so the other issue was interesting is Tony has the right to privacy. Um, so there's no legal case that says that Tony has the right to privacy under a uh, interrogation. Uh, and you could see the problem with this. Um, you know, it, no cop would be able to do their job if everyone had a right to privacy not to tell the police anything. Um, but again, this goes back to this this misunderstanding of what the right to representation is and the misunderstanding of how police actually behave. And then one answer was based on the classroom, um, which is earlier in the fact pattern, which I think is probably uh, important. Um, in other words, would there have been, you know, it, would there have been so many injustices if the legal issues were clearer earlier in the education environment. And this goes to the idea that perhaps um, folks who have powerful positions might be able to alter people's ideas about power and law and equality and justice um, if they follow the rules. So the problem with this answer is you see here there's there's a, a conflict between norms of a classroom norms within your agreement like what you think is moral uh, and then norms that are in the constitution norms in the first amendment and then norms that are called the henderson rules that that operate within colleges uh, so in order to decide which set of rules that you're going to follow uh, is very complicated and then there's one misapplication of a rule. Um, someone referred to Marbury versus Madison. Uh, however, this case stands for the right of the Supreme Court not to decide a case before the court. So I'm not sure how that would be relevant uh, in this particular issue. Um, so what did I learn from you all, uh, you, you know, and, and what you, how you're thinking about rights and law and injustice? Well, most of you saw the lack of an attorney, usually called due process rights, as the cause of the harm or choice as cause. Um, Again, I think this probably comes from TV and movies and, and has a very um, underdeveloped idea of, of how psychology works. Uh, so this is not quite right. Um, I want to highlight the part that I think is good that you all did. Um, you all were able to identify an injustice and link it to some legal rule. That was the first thing I really wanted you to be able to do. Uh, so that, you know, you get full credit for. You were able to do that. Um, where you got into complications is the cause. Now, you know, you should be, you know, this is a 66 and 67 courses are the courses I teach, and these are sophomore and junior level courses. You should be better at causation than you are. Um, but let's assume that that's difficult because we're online uh, and there's COVID and there's all these problems. Um, so let me try to just get at this uh, as clearly as I can, given those very considerable difficulties. 
So in reality, almost nobody, and I would say nobody gets Sixth Amendment rights. So it's not that you're wrong in that the Sixth Amendment is a lovely ideal. Uh, you're wrong in the sense that this never actually happens in real life. Um, so we've gone back to law being an object that is an ideal object and that if everyone would just follow the law, then everything would be OK. Well, maybe you're right, but no one follows the law. So then it's a useless answer. It has nothing to do with the cause. Um, and, you know, I, I've tried to help steer you this way, but it, it seems like it's not quite sinking in. So here's the thing, right? Um, if the Sixth Amendment were clear, then everyone would get a lawyer that would just kind of pop up, right? The police show up at your house, uh, they're going to arrest you, and then out of your pocket comes your lawyer and says, I'm here representing the law, right? That obviously is never going to happen. Um, but besides that idea, you were incorrect. There are very few judges, if any, um, that would have applied Miranda here for, for several reasons. Um, the first one is that there's a broad exception involving a situation involving a threat to public safety. You know, there, there's protest looting and a fire going on outside of the uh, police interrogation. So that is itself the exception. Um, in other words, it is very unlikely that a lawyer would have been able to get to the interrogation. The second issue, though, is that the suspect uh, tried to answer all of the questions. Um, in other words, he he asked about getting a lawyer. Uh, the police officer said that they he'd get one when they are done dealing with those stupid protesters. In other words, when the threat to public safety is over. Uh, he didn't have to say anything. However, he did try to answer all the questions. So he essentially revoked uh, his right to Miranda by participating in the conversation. He reinitiated the questioning. But then finally, uh, when a suspect tries to invoke their rights under the Miranda decision um, before the time in which they're put into custody, in other words, it is not clear uh, that he is under arrest. He is detained. Now, a couple of you actually dealt with that issue, and I, I applaud you for, for getting into that. Um, however, you know, under the Patriot Act, uh, he, he probably could have been um, interrogated. Under the emergency powers, he could have probably been interrogated. But in this case, he's not really getting interrogated. Um, you could say that when the, the police officer asked him or the detective asked, isn't that why you were in on the stolen merchandise? That is the first time he makes a claim. Um, but then, you know, Chime bangs on the door because there's a fire. So at that point, you know, if Tony had said, I demand a lawyer, that would have been at that point um, Miranda. And any of the things he said before that would not be admissible in court. And that's really what the Miranda rule is for. Uh, it's to eliminate evidence that would go uh, to court if you were to give it. But let me go back. No one's going to court. Uh, so Miranda also doesn't really apply because it doesn't have anything to do with most of law. If only 3% of human beings are actually going to court and 97% of them are not, then Miranda is 97% irrelevant to law. Uh, in other words, it just doesn't apply. Um, again, let's go back to our thoughts here. The problem is, is the myth of rights. We believe, we want to believe in pop culture that rights, again, will jump out of your pocket, that they'll protect you, and all you have to say to the police officer is, I have a right. Well, it doesn't really matter, right, that you say that. Uh, there's nothing that prevents the police officer or any other human from saying, I don't care about your rights. Uh, and really, most of the time, as you're seeing in these cases, uh, they don't get punished. Um, so even though we know that this is not an object, people still insist on believing them. Uh, the problem is, as you saw, there are exceptions to the rule. And so law is not absolute. It's not universal. In fact, it's governed. It's led by exceptions. Um, and then obviously legal rules are super flexible uh, and they're not equally applied. And then finally, it's just a language tool. So again, it's not an object. It's not a hammer. It's not a gun. It's not something that you can actually use uh, other than trying to persuade somebody that you're correct. And so I'm not looking for a right answer in this hypothetical, largely because that would be pretty much impossible uh, for your first attempt uh, at thinking about constitutional law. 
Uh, no student is a master of constitutional law uh, in 13 weeks when we're on campus, let alone uh, when you're off campus. So that's not the object. This is not a math class, right? It's not a uh, history class to see if you can memorize a few things. What I'm trying to get you to do is the right process, not to focus on the right answer. Uh, in law, there is usually never a right answer. Um, there's one of many answers. So did you identify a legal rule and stick with it? Yes. Pat yourself on the back. Most of you did this. This is really what I'm trying to get you to do at this point in the semester. Um, did you apply the facts to legal rule reasonably? Most of you did. You made very good arguments that stuck to your legal rule. Uh, so I feel very good about it. Does your decision match the legal rule? No, most of you did not do this, but this goes to a lack of knowledge about laws uh, and legal systems, right? There's not one legal system. There's multiple legal systems within America. Um, so I'm not expecting you to be able to do that well. I would say that those of you who did it well, um, for example, a couple of you claimed criminal negligence. Um, if you said that the police officer should be essentially arrested uh, for violent behavior, um, I don't think any judge would actually go with that or a prosecutor. Um, you can certainly make the argument, um, but the decision doesn't match the legal rule. You didn't provide a legal rule that said that I can charge someone uh, with a crime if they are negligent um, in a police interrogation setting. So it doesn't match, right? It's not that to say that you couldn't find that case. You absolutely could. Uh, and for your final exam, perhaps you might want to try to find that case. Um, but this goes to the larger problem is that no one and none of the answers were able to see how the rule would apply in the future cases. In fact, almost nobody even tried to say this. Um, judges are like I just kind of explained, you know, they have to match the rule and the decision have to go together. And so in the future, if we're just looking at the, the injustice of Tony, uh, we'd really have to look at very specifically um, under what circumstances would a police officer be criminally liable for the accidental death uh, due to fire um, within a precinct. Um, we would need a case about that. Now, if we were talking about Kaime and employment discrimination, we would need a case that that argues um, that either when she was touched, um, which happens all the time in my ride alongs with police officers. Um, so that would be hard to say that that was the that was the discrimination um, that the verbal uh, phrasings, the thing that the police officer said to her were discriminatory. Certainly their prejudice. I'm not sure they, they, I, I'm pretty sure they do not meet the level of legal discrimination. Um, and you'd also have to get into what, what was the harm. So again, if you wanted to look at Kaime, I think you'd have to look at wrongful death, right? So in other words, should she get the benefits? A few of you looked at the benefits and I think that was the right decision, uh, as far as the process here. Um, for those of you who looked in the classroom, you'd have to look at, you know, at what what are discriminatory discriminatory statements uh, and how do they affect the student in the classroom environment? In this case, the harm is fairly clear because the student got a bad grade. Um, so that would level uh, that would lead to the level of retaliation. Um, again, you know, nobody focused uh, on Maxine and her child uh, who were put in handcuffs during the protest uh, to me. Um, that might be an easier uh, route to go. Um, but again, you still have to find a legal rule and make that decision. So most of you are probably saying, oh man, this is super hard. Well, yeah, I've said that a few times. Uh, law is super hard, right? This is not a history class. This isn't a biology class. Uh, this is a class in which it's much harder to make these arguments because there's a lot of knowledge that you have to accumulate. Um, and most of you are doing a good job of accumulating or gaining more knowledge, uh, which will increase your ability to make these arguments over time. And again, I'm trying to prepare those of you who are going into John Jay or some other transfer college. Um, and if you're going into the police academy, hopefully you'll think about this before you behave, right? Before you follow procedures. Uh, and you'll try to think about it that way. So here's the issue that you're really trying to nail um, in the next few weeks. 
the cause of the harm, you know, what happened uh, to the individuals in this hypo was not based on the individual choices of other humans. It was based on the systemic power uh, given to police and to the state to maintain order at the detriment of human rights of the individual and group. Uh, the most evidence of this is the Patriot Act. So once you give your rights away to other human beings, um, you cannot then hold them accountable uh, for violating your rights. You already gave them away. Uh, if you're in charge of your own life uh, and you have freedom uh, to resist, uh, then of course you could say, well, now they're violating my rights. But if you've given that right away and now it's the police and the state, the government that's supposed to protect you, uh, at best you could only hold them negligent, which is a, a tort. Um, so that leads us here. Torts or negligence uh, would be much more likely than a criminal prosecution. Why? Well, you know, criminal prosecutions, first of all, are very expensive. Uh, but you're asking the state to prosecute people who work for the state. Uh, so when you see police officers being charged in these recent um, cases with murder and then they're not convicted, maybe you shouldn't be surprised, right? Because it's it's the state prosecuting the state uh, and they don't really want to see the state being held responsible. So that's why civil lawsuits, those are from uh, non-state actors. Those are from pro uh, pl lawyers who are, are bringing a case against the state uh, to get financial uh, or some other remedy, um, but not a crime, right? Because a crime belongs to the state, not to non-state actors. That's complicated, um, but that's something you should learn in crime and punishment or in criminology uh, or even in American government um, at some point in the future, the separation between the public and the private, um, public being the state, the private being the civil lawsuits. So the point here is that the rule of law is a tension, uh, a conflict, a pull, a give, and, a give and take between the right of the state, the police, to maintain control, uh, especially with property, uh, over individuals against the right of the individual or a group to maintain their freedom and their autonomy in their pursuit of property, liberty, and happiness. You're seeing this play out with people claiming they have a right uh, to keep their business open during COVID. They don't have that right. Now, they believe they do. They want to have that right. Um, but they gave up that right when they gave the state the right to give them a license to have a business. Now, that means the state is responsible uh, and not the individual. You obviously have a right in your own house to do what you want, more or less. Uh, but again, that right has been given away to the state in the form of the Patriot Act, uh, the war against drugs, the war against property, uh, etc. So there's always this pull between the right of the state to maintain the control that you gave it uh, and then the right that individuals want to have uh, or they want to resist that control. Now, one interesting observation Many of you are able to see the racist, sexist system as the cause. Uh, and many of you are able to see this in the dialogue between the two characters uh, in the classroom. Th this is interesting. Um, and I think for those of you who saw this, you should, you should go further into this for your final exam uh, and think about what's going on at that local level uh, where people start talking about their experiences and their understandings of law uh, as they are different from their home experience and what they see in pop culture, when they start experiencing the law as real as opposed to ideal. Um, the reason why this is interesting from my point of view uh, is that the revolutionary founders acted in violation of English law after seeing they could regulate their own life. So much like a classroom, when you start to kind of regulate your own life uh, and then you can regulate a community, in other words, you can operate and learn without the professor, uh, that is liberty. Um, and that is what social construction is. Now, they cited it very much like judges, and many of them were legally trained, uh, the Magna Carta, uh, which said that they had the right to resist uh, the power of the king. So this is the legal rule they were using against arbitrary and capricious use of power, uh, which about three students actually referred to uh, arbitrary and capricious use of power. So in other words, uh, when the state or the police uh, exceed what was given to them, uh, then we can then bring a claim, a cause of action against them 
uh, based in this ancient English common law principle, uh, and this is what was known as the rule of law. Now, they did this because they felt that they were not full citizens, that the English crown, that the, the government at the time was treating them like half citizens or quasi citizens. Uh, in other words, they had taken so many rights over the individuals that they no longer had control over their own life. I don't know if that sounds familiar to you, but it sounds familiar to me. The problem, of course, as T Thomas Jefferson writes in the Declaration of Independence, is that it's really hard to get a group of people to act together one, uh, and to decide that enough is enough. So when you see these protests forming saying enough is enough, uh, this is now a bunch of people getting together saying the government or the state or police have gone too far. They've abused their power. So what is going on with the apathetic group? Well, look, they're suffering, but they're, you know, they're suffering to the point where it's OK. In other words, they have a nice TV. They have a house. Uh, they don't like what's going on. It makes them uncomfortable to see it on the news, but they can just turn the news off. Um, they don't have to think about these things. Uh, and the majority of, of folks in America, you know, this is more or less what they're doing. They're just kind of ignoring it and going about their daily lives. Um, they're going to do that until the situation becomes um, one in which they feel like they have to change the, the social relations in order to protect their own children uh, and their own well-being. So I, I want to end with this idea of let's now bring it back to the college. Right. So there are several lawsuits that you can look up against Kingsborough Community College and people who work there um, brought by professors. So one interesting question then is why are professors uh, who are not legally trained more likely to start a lawsuit? Why are they more likely to believe in the myth of rights and go out and get a lawyer uh, to try to change the college um, than for students, right? So students are a larger group and are more likely to be powerless and more likely to uh, be victims or suffer injustice. Uh, and yet students uh, I'm not aware of a single student who has brought a legal challenge or a Department of Inve uh, J Justice Department investigation. Um, so in other words, you all say that you believe in the law as ideal, law as an ob object, but when you experience injustice, most of you do not actually use law as a language of social uh, justice. And so we want to think about that power difference, right? There's a certain element of knowledge and a certain element of experience that you need in order to see how uh, law can be used as a tool. The second question would be, which is more likely to suffer from discrimination at the workplace uh, or an educational setting? In other words, uh, when you work, and most of you do work, um, there are norms, there are behaviors, there are patterns uh, that folks uh, practice, let's say. Um, but those are all, you know, the workplace is a, is a property based economic system. Uh, and so those are all based in that kind of property based uh, set of values. The educational setting, on the other hand, is not a capitalist or a, a workplace. Uh, even for those of us who work there, um, it's governed by public laws or human rights based laws. Uh, this should be a hint as to why professors are likely to sue under um, human rights violations, uh, because the workplace laws are different than if I go work uh, at Microsoft or um, Amazon or, or some other company. Now, I just want you to think about that, though, again, who's more likely to suffer from discrimination? Who's more likely to experience an injustice, uh, a student or a professor? And then finally, um, and then what kind of right student or professor right? are, are men or women uh, are people of color? Uh, who, who's most likely uh, to suffer the injustice uh, is a transgendered individual uh, more likely, for example. And then finally, what do these complications, everything I've kind of made harder for you uh, in this pres presentation, how does this change your idea of power that you started off the semester with? Um, again, I'm trying to get you to see as power is more of a field of social relations uh, closer to the racist um, property based system uh, 
than it is to something that's with inside of you uh, or even worse, something that you can like pull out of the air. Um, so I want you to think about this as you move forward. Uh, again, it's about the process, uh, not finding the right answer. So let me just review that real quick. So you remember, um, you know, you just want to think about, you know, does your decision, does the thing you think happen, does that match a legal rule? Can you find judicial opinions uh, that talk about that specifically? Uh, and then how does this affect judicial decisions and behavior in the future? Now, again, I'm not asking you to be an expert at this. I'm just asking you to start thinking about this.